Hello my lovelies and welcome to the Clueless Fanga YouTube channel. I create content like this, law videos, live streams and podcasts on Lord of the Ring or rather Tolkien's works on a weekly basis. If you want to follow me on social media, all links are in the description of this video. Enjoy. Hello my lovelies and welcome back. So this is the second part of my Kings of Numenor series and if you haven't watched the first one I would strongly recommend to do that because I think it makes more sense. Okay so we ended and finished in the first video with the 12th King of Numenor. Let's go to his son now. The next king to follow was the 13th and his name was Tar Atanamir, who gave himself the glorious suffix the great. Well, you can imagine he wasn't a modest king. He ruled for 192 years and even there are various problems with the dates as we have conflicting dates in various books. His name also meant jewel of men and to be honest, jewels are questionable to say the least, in Tolkien's Legendarium. He was also the first king who ruled for life, well, after Eros. The annals say he was a greedy and proud king. Therefore, it is not a surprise that we learn that men and their settlements in Middle-earth were treated as colonies and they had to pay heavy tributes to the Numenorians, who grew stronger and more powerful by the day. But we also learn that the more joyful their life was, the more they began to long for immortality. I mean, it makes sense. Numenor went from a former rural island of a few chosen ones to a modern warfaring nation with unlimited powers and funds. The face of the island and its cities changed as well as its people. The richer they got, the more they wanted and the longer they wanted to live to continue with what they have. But actually the opposite occurred and the Numenorians as well as their kings lived shorter and shorter lives. Under Atanamir, Numenor reached its highest height, but with it, it starts to morally decline. People under his rule began to speak openly against the ban of the Valar and slowly two fractions began to form. Those of the kingsmen, openly greedy and questioning everything they once believed in taught by the Valar, and those of the faithful. More on these two later on though. The Valar learning of this sent messengers explaining, or rather warning as I find, the Numenorians that even if they reach the Undying Lands, their doom would not be undone. Atanamir, who knew the law of his ancestors, brought up his forefather Earendil, who also was a mortal and who still lived, although as a star in the sky, but still, he was alive. He did sail to Valinor plead for the aid in the War of Wrath and still live till this day. No explanation of the Valar could convince the king and his descendants of the plain truth that even in the undying lands, Iluvatar's secondborn would still be doomed to die. Talking of dying, Atanamir was also called later in life the unwilling, meaning unwilling to die. And you can see that in the time he ruled, which according to various other sources might have been even longer than the 192 years we get from Unfinished Tales, for example. In the Tale of Years, we get the info that Tar Atanamir takes the scepter in 2251, which doesn't make sense because he died according to other texts a few years earlier. So how can he take the scepter? But it could be his real death. And what else happened in that year? Correct, the Nazgul appeared for the first time. So this could hint that he was one of the nine or the witch king himself. But again, another topic, another video. Important fact we get from Unfinished Tales as well is that his time in his time, the shadow fell upon Numenor. I personally think this could also indicate that Sauron came to Numenor, which I believe was the case, and he was at the king's courts before he came back with Arpharazon. Because who is referred to as the shadow? Correct, Sauron. 
Tolkien could have chosen to word it otherwise. It's not that he didn't have enough words for evil arising, for example. Let's go to the next king, Tar and Kalimon, the 14th king who ruled for 165 years. So we are back on the shortening of the ruling and the span of lifetime of the kings. Atanamir was an exception. His reign was mainly the time of the forsaking of the elven tongue. It was no longer taught to children, at least not by the king's men, and the Numenorians split now openly into two fractions, the faithful and the king's men. He still kept his royal title in Quenya, rather out of fear of changing old customs um, and that bringing ill fortunes. The 15th king, Tar Telemaite, who ruled for 140 years. During his rule it became custom that the kings ruled till their death and only then the heirs took over. Interesting fact is that we learn of Mithril in the Silmarillion and Unfinished Tales due to Telemites' love or probably rather greed for silver. And he was always searching for Mithril, one of the most precious metals in Tolkien's work. I also plan to make a video about Numenor itself, its shape and how it might have looked, its cities and treasures. Let me know in the comments if you would be interested in that. We do not have a lot, but I want at least try to paint a picture of how Numenor was and how it was to live there. Our next ruler was a queen, the third ruling in her own right ruling, Queen Tar. She ruled for 111 years and she was the 16th monarch of Númenor. Yes, we're getting closer to the end, guys. She was not fond of ruling and rather spent her time with pleasurable things, dance and music. She left ruling to her husband, Herul Kamo, who you can see is a descendant of Tar Atanamir, the 13th king, so from the same line as the queen, although not a direct cousin. After her death, instead of their son taking the kingship, Herul Kamu usurped the throne and named himself Tar Andukal. You can see how far the mighty kings of men have come. Rulers who refuse to rule, usurpers to the throne. Sounds like real history, but not like the idealized kingship we know from Tolkien when he talks of the line of kings of men and the examples of Aragorn or Elros. As Tar Andukal is not reckoned in the true line of kings, we go straight to his son, the 17th king, Tar Alkarin. He ruled for 80 years. Yes, the time spans get shorter and shorter now. After his father's death, he took finally over. We do not learn much about him though, except the ruling dates. The next king was his son and later king Tar Kalmakil, who ruled for 88 years and lived only for 308 years. He was known to be a great warrior and he expanded Numenor's territories and made Sauron retreat further east, refusing to go to open war with the growing Numenorean powers in Middle-earth. He was the first king whose loyal kingsman called him by his Anduniak name Arbelzega. And I can't wonder if this has anything to do with the Belzebub, another name for Satan in the Hebrew and Christian Bible. Let's go to the next king. The 19th king was Tar Adamin, who ruled for 74 years. His Andunic name was Ar Abatarik. Oh my god, these names. He was the last ruler to use both the Quenyan royal name and the Anduniak one, foreshadowing that from now on things will get even worse and the Numenorians will abandon the Valar soon completely. Also, his Anduniak name meant pillar of the world, so modesty was long gone since Atanamir the Great. His son, the 20th king, Ar Adunkor, who was now openly ascending the throne using only his Anduniak name, Ar Adunkor. Also, his Anduniak name literally meant Lord of the West, which was blasphemy, as the real lords of the West were the Valar, and it was known to all. It actually reminds me of Melkor and Sauron and later even Arpharazon calling themselves King of the World or King of Men. 
The still loyal line of the faithful considered this as a mortal sin. Under his rule, they started persecuting and watching the few faithful men that were left in Numenor. Also, the ships of the Valar stopped coming to Numenor openly now. Some still set harbour close to the faithful settlements in the west of the island, though. After him followed his son, Ar Zimraton, the 21st ruler who ruled for 71 years. The only thing we really know about his name meant collector of jewels and again it probably symbolizes the growing greed of the kings and all Numenorians. The 22nd king was Ar Sakaltor and again we do not know much about him except his name means son of the coast which probably meant he was a sea king or explorer as well adding to the riches of Numenor. He died aged 226 years or so half of the time span of his ancestors a few centuries before him. Again showing the grace of the Valar has almost left Numenor. Now it's getting interesting as we get a record mingling of the two lines. The line of the faithful, the earlier almost Queen Silmarian and the line of the ruling kings with the 23rd king Argimilzor. Marrying Incilbeth, a lady from the house of the lords of Andunio, both houses now finally reunite. Although we hear this happened before and the kings often married into that line, but we did not get names and dates before this marriage specifically. This king actually was an open enemy to the faithful and he grew very suspicious as he knew some elven ships still sailed to the western parts of Numenor. He called the elves openly the spies of the Valar and completely banished and persecuted the use of the elven tongue. He even went that far as to exile them to the city of Romena to be able to control aka spy on them. This actually would save the faithful that escaped the downfall, the later downfall, as they could escape Numenor from the east coast they were banished to by the king way easier than they would have been able to coming from their origins in the west, as the Silmarillion states. Under his rule, some of the faithful left Numenor even before its downfall, and they built permanent settlements mainly in Pelagir. He was also the first king that never set foot on the holy mountain to worship Eru, the Minel Tarma. And he also started neglecting the White Tree of Numenor, who we know later as the White Tree of Gondor. He had two sons. The firstborn, Palantir, was, like his mother, secretly a faithful and faithful to the Valar. And the old beliefs, his younger son, though, Gimilkad, was just like his father, full with hate of the Valar. The marriage of Gimilzor and Inzebeth, the king and the queen, was, according to Tolkien, not a happy one. And there was no love after he found out she was secretly a faithful. And so was their firstborn son and later king. He could not change, though, the law of succession and let his younger son, who was more like him and shared his beliefs, ascend the throne after him. In 3177, second age, Tar Palantir became the new king and the 24th king of Numenor after his father's death. And just by his title, you can guess that he at least tried to reunite with the Valar and even the elves and go back to where Numenor started. His Anduniac name actually meant Flower of the West, which, yes, is pretty close to Flame of the West, Aragon's reforged sword Anduril. Tolkien states when he took the throne, it was a time of great darkness in Numenor, so the shadow had already fallen and almost taken up Numenor fully. But just like a flame, there was still hope and it wasn't the point of no return yet. He started to tend the white tree again and the Menel Tarma became a sacred place for the Numenorians once more. All his attempts to get back in the good graces of the Valar and the elves were for nothing, as no ships of the elves ever came and no messenger ever came with a reply from the west and the Valar. He also had to deal with his rebellious brother and nephew Farazon, leading the king's men, which is ironic because now, since a long, long time, Numenor had a faithful king again. 
He kind of withdrew from ruling and the world and mainly spent his days in the tower of Tarminasir, trying to gaze west. But not of envy, more out of hope, I would say. Hope to get a sign from the lords of the west. But no sign ever came. He was known as a seer and his name Palantiri speaks volumes. He was literally named after the seeing stones, the Noldor, of which some actually were in Numenor. He prophesied that if the white tree would ever perish, the line of kings would end, which it, spoiler alert, did. Well, that line of kings. Aragorn is a descendant of the lords of Andunius, Silmarians line, the true kings, if you ask me. He married late in life and only had one daughter, Miriel. And no, she did not become the rightful ruling monarch. Instead, her cousin, Gimilkad's son, Farazon, married her against her will and against the laws of Numenor and proclaimed himself the king, the 25th and last king of Numenor. Arpharazon the Golden, yes, the Golden. He only ruled for 64 years and died aged 201. There will be a video on him alone, so I won't go too deep into his life, but it is important to understand the state of Numenor. We went from a short time of peace back to the chaos and the darkening of Numenor. Before becoming the king, he fought wars in Middle-earth against Sauron and became a great leader and commander. Shortly after he became king, Sauron openly proclaimed himself king of men and said he wants to drive all Numenorians back into the sea. More angered by Sauron proclaiming himself the king of men, a title Farazon thought to be his, he went to Middle-earth and it came that he built a massive armada and really set sail to Middle-earth to defeat Sauron. Sauron, being Sauron, realized he could not defeat them by strength alone. And he humbled himself before the king and was taken prisoner to Numenor. I myself believe he had been in Numenor before. He was a shapeshifter after all. And I do believe the mentioning of the shadow had also to do with Sauron poisoning the Numenorians against the Valar from within. He met at least one of the questionable kings before in Middle-earth, fighting them, and I do think he made some of them ring raids, so he must have known a lot about Numenor itself. I will talk about this more in my Arpharazon video. Also, I do have a video with my theory on how Sauron really caused the downfall of Numenor, also in this Numenor playlist, if you are interested. Sauron went from prisoner to the king's closest advisor in less than three years and poisoned the king's and just told him more and more lies, basically. Sauron even got the king thus far as worshipping Melkor and the darkness and we can only imagine all was lost at this point. The king though hesitated to cut down the white tree as his uncle foretold the line of kings would end with cutting down the tree. But after a disguised Isilda stole one fruit from Nimloth, the king did finally agree to cut the sacred tree down and Sauron burned it in his temple. The king even went that far as to sacrifice faithful men in Sauron's temple and worship the darkness. When the king grew older and weaker, he fell for Sauron's last advice to rage open war against the Valar and conquer Valinor to become immortal. Nine years he prepared for this war and finally set sail. His fate is unknown, as Numenor drowned and the shape of the world changed when they set foot in the Undying Lands. In the Akalabeth it is said that they set foot on the land and were buried under falling hills and till today lie in the caves of the Forgotten until the last battle and the doomsday. Pretty cool ending. So. That was the end of the line of the Numenorean kings, but not the end of the line of Eros. Some survived the downfall and set sail to Middle-earth, where they founded the kingdoms of Arnor and Gunda. Again, a video in the Numenor series I want to write. 25 kings and queens, some good, some unwilling, some bad. If you ask me, it went wrong when Silmarion did not become queen and when Sauron started to interfere. And that was a long time before he was actually captured and officially came to Numenor. Thank you, my lovelies, for listening. I really enjoyed making this video. It was a long time coming. And as I promised, there will be more videos on Numenor.
Thanks and have a great day.